The late Floyd Sparky Sweet is credited with creating a breakthrough magnetic solid state motor. A magnetic specialist with a distinguished industrial career, Sweet was a man whose technical claims could not be easily dismissed. Many credible witnesses saw his device work and Toby Groats was able to photograph these demonstrations. This is Floyd Sweet's vacuum trion amplifier powering two 100 watt incandescent lamps and a small DC motor. The term vacuum triode amplifier or VTA is a word that was coined by Tom Bearden in order to explain the phenomenon of how energy from the zero point energy state was coupled into Floyd Sweet's over unity free energy device. The hardware configured in this photograph was set up and run producing in excess of over two million to one power gain. It's uh, definitely one of the outstanding examples of how zero point energy over unit devices can be made to actually function and work. Floyd Sweet, in addition to actually having I'm absolutely convinced a master's degree from, in electrical engineering from MIT was a very sharp individual. I can certainly attest to that. Walter Rosenthal, who is a very fine test engineer, and that's the way he made his living for many years. He's a good test engineer, and he knows how to test systems. Walt did see the closed-loop system that was self-powering, that Sweet made, and did, in fact, measure it and touch it and taste it and punch it and look at it, and it was for real, and it did work. As we explained, all you have to do is take off the proper amount to replace your input, and the rest of it then continues to be furnished right out of the environment, which in this case is the active vacuum. Floyd was a, a specialist at designing transformers. He had worked for many years in all kinds of things, but he was very good at his trade. And when he retired, a lot of the companies would still come to him to design their transformers. He could design them a little bit more efficiently and a little less power required to run them and everything and more stably than most of their engineers. So Floyd got extra consulting work from time to time for quite a while by his ability to design superior transformers. He was a transformer specialist. And in his long years of experience, he had noticed several things. He had noticed some phenomenology with transformers that wasn't in the textbook. And in applying that with some magnets, he had noticed some magnetic effects in permanent magnets that wasn't in the textbook. Let me talk about these effects because now one of them is in the textbook. He had noticed that permanent magnet material, and particularly barium, fer barium ferrite, was capable of self-oscillation. Now understand this is way before we had any of the magnificent thin film research that we have going on today and everything. Today, if I say self-oscillation and barium ferrite materials and other, a few other magnetic materials, it doesn't raise an eyebrow. In the old days, people would look at you and say you were crazy. You can't have self-oscillation in a permanent magnet. You certainly can. And one of the things that so vividly impressed me about his work, one of the first things Floyd did when I first went to see him, he handed me one of his conditioned permanent magnets, barium ferrite magnets, the old audio magnets, the big brick magnets that the audio stores used to sell surplus. He'd go down and buy them out of surplus. And only about one in 10 would work right and usually one in 30 would work superbly. He had a procedure where he scanned the surface and looked how much the field varied. If it varied too much, he couldn't use it. it wouldn't hold the self-oscillation condition. If it was particularly smooth and didn't vary too much, it was a candidate that would hold it. So what he did, he found a way to trick this magnet into self-oscillation. Now let's reason together here. What do we mean? Here's the magnet sitting on the table, absolutely still. Nobody's moving a thing. But the field, the magnetic field of the magnet is waving back and forth. And so you can take a shim stock, or if you're out of shim stock, a uh, single edge razor blade, and put on this permanent magnet, and, and with a little trouble you can get it to stand up in that field, and you can get it to wave back and forth. And just turn it loose, and it'll sit there on a properly conditioned 
sweet magnet. It'll sit there and wave just like now it's doing work all the time against the air. I want to point this out. This thing is doing work. So it's getting energy somewhere. We're not violating the conservation of energy law. It's the field that's vibrating and pushing that blade, you see. I took one of those magnets with an oscillating blade on it and put it in the safe and locked it up for 24 hours with it waving. I put the key in my pocket and took it off. The next day, 24 hours later, I unlocked it and it was sitting in there and the blade was still waving. There's no way on God's green earth you can fake that. If you do, you got a trick you really can sell, I guarantee you. But there's no way to fake it. Well, you can see if the field is waving, if I put a coil around here, it's gonna, the field will cut the coil. And standard magnetic theory will tell me I'm going to have current in this coil, oscillating current. But he found if he put the coils at right angles, he could have one that he could control the self-oscillation and create, uh, it was almost like a triode. As he varied on the one that was his signal grid, so to speak, the other coil was a power grid and would dramatically change its output power. So he had formed a very special case of something that could be called a triode. So I said, Floyd, it works exactly like a triode, only you're taking the energy out of the vacuum, and it's an amplifier. So that's a vacuum triode amplifier. That's where VTA came from. But they weren't using any kind of moving ma um, razor blade, were they? No, you just stuck it on there. It was the field of the, the magnet was the moving the, ma the razor blade. Right. And, but the razor blade was continuously doing work by pushing air. It was fanning the air and doing work all the time. So unless you want to throw away the conservation of energy law, it was getting energy all the time. And so the question then became, how is it getting the energy? What is a peculiar thing about barium in the table of elements? The binding energy of atoms is uh, the uh, nucleons is negative. And if you'll check the curve, you'll find that about the knee of this curve, barium occurs. It's a funny place in the, in the curve that represents the binding energy. So what it means in simple terms is there is a point where if you can get it into oscillation, get that barium atom into oscillation right there at that point, it won't climb up out of this energy well that it's in on the knee of that curve. It may vary back and forth a little, but it'll pretty well oscillate at a given frequency. And by the way, that frequency can be pretty low. It can be 400 hertz or it can be 60 hertz. Sweet could change the frequency by some, some numbers he had found out how to design. Now, Rosenthal built for him, he had a great deal of trouble with activation. Rosenthal built for him a special circuit that accurately controlled the discharge time when he did his activation. And once Rosenthal delivered that thing to him, Sweet was able to then activate his magnets much, much easier. Before that, he'd bang away for a couple of weeks before he'd get one activated, unless he was real lucky. After that, almost the first bang, he always had it. And uh, he got that precision by some work that Walter Rosenthal did for him. So, but he had some found a way to trick that barium nucleus in a barium ferrite magnet into that self-oscillation. And if he had chosen a magnet where it was pretty steady conditions everywhere in the magnet, it wasn't too rough of, of uh, defects in it, it would hold the condition. And so the magnet would hold that. Now most of them will not hold it. You can get them to activate for a second or two and then they'll die right out. Uh, later I worked with some people that were able to get activation for five weeks, but nobody that I know of ever got activation longer than that except Floyd Sweet. His would stay activated until you gave a mechanical shock or until you shorted the ends. You could tell it was negative energy of the device because when you shorted the output together, it did not get hot and melt. It got instantly cold and ice froze on it from the water vapor in the air. Would it drive a load indefinitely? Yes, it would drive a load. He could light lights, he could drive motors, and he could turn fans and all of that because negative energy is easily turned into positive energy. One way to do it, all you got to do is charge a capacitor backwards, reverse your leads since it's negative energy. It'll still charge it normally, and then you discharge normal energy out of it. It's a piece of cake. Bedini has shown that with great accuracy. So uh, you can change it back and forth between the kind of energy it is if you get tricky with it. 
But he was able to power motors, to power lights, and, and some of the films and all you'll see, and powering lights and fan motors and all kinds of things. And the thing that really intrigued me was when I saw the freezing occur on it and realized it was negative energy mostly rather than positive energy, because positive energy would have got hot and melted then uh, and wouldn't have got cold. Then, you know, it suggested the anti-gravity experiment, and that one was successful. So I really thought, and I still think, that the loss of the sweep device was a great loss to the scientific community. So I really hated to see that become lost like it was, and Sweet carry the full secret of his activation uh, to his grave with him. What was it that was so proprietary about? How he activated the magnets was the proprietary uh, thing. So what, um, what Rosenthal built for him only took it part of that it? That was only part of it. There was another part of the activation that didn't depend on the discharge. Part of it depended on heating. You had to heat the barium ferrite to an exact temperature of about 320 degrees Fahrenheit. You had to soften the, uh, what we normally call the, uh, there are parts of the magnet that we consider domains, and you had to soften those domains. They're a little too hard for self-resonance. They wipe it out every time. That's the reason you don't get self-resonant magnets from popping them. But if you soften the domains enough and get it just right and get a good magnet that's, not, that's pretty uniform in its field, strength everywhere, you can, if you hit it just right and you do the discharge just right in activating it, you can activate that barium nucleus into self-oscillation. Then you've got a sweet kinetic magnet. By the way, he also explained that in the old days, a few of the old magnetics guys had stumbled onto self-activated magnets like this, and they called them kinetic magnets. He already knew that it was possible to do that. He had known one or two people who could do it at least a little bit. So there is some, not history, but some folklore experience back to the old guys of a few people who found that you could get magnets to oscillate for a while, self-oscillate. Today, in thin film material and so forth, self-oscillation of magnetic materials is, uh, is in the textbook. It's not something you've got to go reproof. Nobody has thought to use it for power other than sweet, as far as I know. Everything uses it for something else. But the phenomenology itself of that effect occurring is now in the textbook. In the activation procedure, he did use a coil, uh, at least in the earlier stages, after he had the special thing from Walt Rosenthal, so he had precision in his discharge. He also used a center tap coil, but he would never discuss the use of how he used the center tap. So I don't know. That's the 10 to 20 percent that I don't know what he did. He actually got that barium atom in the magnet to go into self-oscillation, and he got a group for our, what we call a non-local or global phenomenon so that they all got in phase. But that's okay. Self, you know, Self-phasing of self-oscillation is, is known. And so the whole magnetic field of the magnet was just sitting there and waving back and forth. And you could put a little blade on it and watch it wave.